um, types of hearing loss that are called that is called conductive hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss is a problem in the transmission of sound from uh, the sound source, whether it's a voice or a speaker, uh, into the into the ear. And so this includes uh, things like the eardrum, the ossicles, which are the bones of hearing, and um, the middle ear space with the eustachian tube, which is what we use to equalize the pressure, like on an airplane. Um, and so things that can cause a blocked hearing or conductive hearing loss are uh, earwax, and the medical word for that is cerumen impaction. Um, you can have infections of the external ear canal, and that's more commonly known as swimmer's ear. So you can have a buildup of debris and pus and infection just sitting in your ear canal, uh, and that's swimmer's ear. Or you can have fluid or infection uh, behind your eardrum, and that's called a middle ear infection, otitis media. Uh, the tympanic membrane can get perforated or ruptured or have a hole in it, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. Trauma is a big one, um, scuba diving, um, or an infection can actually cause a hole um, uh, to form in the eardrum. Trauma is big, a uh, big cause of hearing loss, both conductive and, and sensory neural or nerve hearing loss. And then otosclerosis is a genetically inherited disease that causes a type of conductive hearing loss. The bones in the ear, or if you remember from biology, they're the uh, hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Uh, and otosclerosis is where that stirrup bone, right as it enters into the cochlea, um, which is the snail-shaped inner ear organ, um, that bone gets fixed. Um, and actually, it's one of the few surgically correctable types of hearing loss. And so we can actually remove the stirrup, or the stapes as we call it, uh, and replace it with a prosthesis. Um, and you can actually restore hearing. Uh, it typically presents when um, you're about in your 30s, uh, 20s to 30s, and especially in women, for some reason, uh, pregnancy is really what induces that onset of, of this disease. So even though you're born with it and it's genetically inherited, it happens around our, our 20s and our 30s. Sensory neural hearing loss is uh, hearing loss from the inner hair cells, the hair cells inside the cochlea are um, what uh, allows us to send a signal from the cochlea to the brain through the hearing nerve. And it's damage to those hair cells from things like aging, genetic predisposition, or noise exposure um, that causes a nerve hearing loss. Um, so I said a couple of these already, noise exposure is big, you know, with, it, with um, things like Soul Cycle and Spin Class and they're blasting music, uh, you know, in, the, uh, in these things. They have actually have been demonstrated to cause uh, early hearing loss. Uh, there's a really strong genetic predisposition to poor hearing and there are many different types, most of them are not serious. Um, but, um, you know, your genes have a lot to do with um, how well you hear. You can have infections or inner ear inflammation that causes hearing loss. Um, your hearing loss, can, hearing loss can happen suddenly over a period of hours to two or three days. Um, and that's something called sudden hearing loss. It's not very well uh, popularized in the media. Um, but it's actually quite a common cause of hearing loss, and it typically causes one-sided hearing loss or deafness. Acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma is a tumor in the uh, ear on the hearing nerve, uh, and it can cause a variety of things, but particularly hearing loss on one side that's associated with tinnitus and even vertigo. And if you have those three things, uh, then typically we're um, uh, asking for something like an MRI to rule out this tumor. It is a benign tumor, um, but um, uh, that's why it's important if you have hearing loss, especially hearing loss that's worse on one side, to really come in, get an evaluation, make sure it doesn't need to be evaluated further to rule out a more serious underlying thing. 
Um, there are medicines that cause hearing loss, and uh, they're actually um, quite common. Um, antibiotics are a big cause of hearing loss. Antibiotics like gentamicin uh, and tetracycline uh, are big um, uh, antibiotics that can cause hearing loss. Chemotherapy uh, is a big reason for hearing loss. Um, and one in particular, cisplatin, uh, is a type of chemotherapy that can cause hearing loss, but a lot of the chemotherapies can predispose you uh, to hearing loss. Um, and hearing loss should be symmetric. Your hearing, whether it's good or bad, should be the same on both sides. And if it's not, that gives me uh, a little anxiety that uh, I want to work this up further or investigate further. So what's going to happen when you come into the office? Well, uh, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to take your history. Uh, I'm going to perform a physical exam. Uh, I'm going to examine your ears, maybe even look at your ears with a microscope, blow some air into your ears, make sure that your eardrum's moving normally. Maybe I'll use a tuning fork to see if um, uh, I can get a sense of, of uh, what the hearing loss is with the tuning forks. But most likely, I'm going to recommend a complete audiologic evaluation, which is what we call a hearing test. Uh, it's done in a sound isolation room, um, and it's done by our wonderful audiologists um, who we work very closely with. Um, they're going to test tones. They're going to test it two different ways. They're going to test it uh, either with headphones or with earbuds. Uh, and they're also going to vibrate um, the cochlea directly uh, and test uh, the conductive component as well as the nerve component. They're also going to test speech, read you uh, several lists of words and, and see how many you get right. And then we're going to measure uh, the function of the eardrum and the eustachian tube as well. So it's a pretty detailed test. Um, the most common cause of hearing loss is aging of the auditory system. And it has a lot of factors that go into it, diet, nutrition, metabolism, your blood pressure, noise exposure, your ge genetics and stress are all related uh, to, to hearing and um, uh, tinnitus. 60% um, of people over age 70 at least have a mild hearing loss. 30% of those people have a deficit that actually affects their ability to communicate. And it really can affect quality of life. And when you start combining it with vision problems like cataracts or macular degeneration or something, it really can lead to a pretty significant handicap. Um, this here is just to show you, um, you know, how hearing loss uh, really does get more of a problem as we get older. So, uh, of all people aged uh, 20 to, to 35 or so, um, only 3% of those people have hearing loss. 35 to 45, 6%, uh, 45 to 55, 11%. Uh, and when you really get up to over 65, 43% of, of all the people in that age group have hearing loss. Um, so again, it's diagnosed with a detailed hearing test. Um, a big thing is earwax. Earwax is also another thing that just we struggle with as we get older. Uh, and sometimes you just need to come in and have it cleaned out. And um, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. It can really, it can actually help reduce tinnitus. Uh, it can improve hearing. Uh, and improve uh, other minor symptoms like uh, itching and ear clogging. Um, we have a lot of devices available to us to assist with hearing, um, and you know we can recommend what's what's best for you. Things like vibrating alarm clocks and uh, flashing uh, telephone uh, or, or doorbells, uh, TV listening systems, and even personal amplifiers. But really, uh, the mainstay of treatment for hearing loss is hearing aids, um, and we're going to hear a lot more about that. Um, now I'm going to move on to tinnitus. Uh, tinnitus has many different causes. Uh, the most common cause is uh, uh, some degree of sensory neural hearing loss, of a nerve-related hearing loss. About 90% uh, of all people with tinnitus have at least a mild hearing loss. 
Um, some uh, causes of tinnitus are more treatable than others. Tinnitus is only a symptom, um, and uh, it's not actually a disease. Uh, but um, so we have to really try to address what we think is the underlying cause. Like I said, the most common cause is hearing loss, but there are some other causes. Um, and so if you come in with tinnitus, uh, we're definitely going to ask for a hearing test. Um, and uh, CAT scans and MRIs are most often not recommended for something like tinnitus, uh, unless there's some underlying red flag on your exam or your hearing test that I identify. But in the majority of cases, we will not be getting a CAT scan or an MRI just for something like tinnitus. Uh, this is a big list, it's um, small print, um, but uh, it's some of the uh, drugs and medicines that we take that really can cause tinnitus. Uh, and it's important uh, because medications is, is really a big factor in this. Uh, the aminoglycoside antibiotics um, are a big one that is like gentamicin. Uh, neomycin and those type of antibiotics. Uh, the ACE inhibitors that we take for blood pressure, um, anti-malarial drugs are a big cause of tinnitus. Um, medications like benzodiazepines, this is our Valium and our Xanax and our uh, Ativan. These medicines are sometimes used to treat tinnitus, but they're also a big cause of tinnitus. And you're thinking to yourself, how is that possible? But it is. Um, uh, Pepto-bismol can cause uh, uh, tinnitus, calcium channel blockers, which is a common blood pressure medication, uh, some anti-seizure medications, uh, some of these same chemotherapies, um, Celebrex, which is uh, a pain reliever uh, medication, and all medicines in the NSAID family, so aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, all of those medications can contribute to tinnitus. Um, uh, again, more antibiotics are on the list. Um, some of your water pills, the diuretics, can cause tinnitus. Um, and even the medications like Nexium and Prilosec that you take for acid reflux can cause tinnitus. Uh, so, uh, but, and these are the most um, common offending agents. So it's important to take a good medication history and see if um, there's anything that we could potentially switch or change if your tinnitus is, is particularly bothersome. Um, of, of all the 50 million Americans suffer with tinnitus, uh, and about one quarter of those people um, have bothersome tinnitus. And bothersome tinnitus means it interferes with your ability to fall asleep, it interfere, interferes with your ability to uh, concentrate or work. Um, and, um, and so if you fall into that group of people with bothersome tinnitus, um, we have a lot of options for available, available to you. Um, tinnitus can't always be cured. Uh, but the impact and the severity of it, uh, the severity of the impact on your quality of life can certainly be helped. And a lot of that is through counseling um, or tinnitus programs, which we do offer here. Uh, and, and Dr. Calisano is going to talk to you uh, more about. But stimulants are big. Um, anything uh, like coffee, even decaf coffee, decaf tea, cola, nicotine, and alcohol, all these things certainly make tinnitus worse. Uh, may make it worse in the short term while that's in your system, and then when it goes out, the tinnitus typically improves. So it's really important to, um, you know, keep a little diary, a little food diary, um, and and see, you know, do you have your morning coffee, uh, and then an hour later, that's when your ear bothers you. It doesn't mean you have to eliminate the coffee. It just means you now have to decide: is my coffee, you know, more important, or is the tinnitus more important? Uh, to, to treat. So, you know, we talked about this, changing or stopping medications. A lot of times it's just my reassurance in the office that we've checked everything, that nothing is suspicious, it doesn't need to be worked up further. Um, masking is a big help. Masking or sound therapy is introducing more noise into your environment actually helps with tinnitus. Um, and that can be something as simple as a fan in the bedroom or the air conditioner or it could be um, a noise machine, an ocean noise machine on your nightstand. 
Uh, and then a lot of the hearing aids today actually have um, software programmed into them that can introduce masking noise for people who suffer from tinnitus. And it's really important to uh, treat associated conditions. And so if your depression causes insomnia, you know, then the insomnia itself makes the tinnitus worse and then it becomes this vicious cycle. So um, if you have insomnia, we want to treat that. If you have depression, we want to treat that. And TMJ is a really big factor. We'll take questions at the end. Is that all right? If you want to, if you want to write them down so you don't forget. Um, but um, uh, TMJ um, is a big problem. Um, it really does impact the, the severity of tinnitus, um, and it could be something like poorly fitting dentures, uh, a tooth that was extracted, um, or um, you know implants, dental implants that didn't line up correctly, if you change your bite, it, it does have a significant impact on tinnitus. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my part. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, TMJ, is that, is that, was that the question? What is TMJ? TMJ is temporomandibular joint. Uh, and so it's the jaw joint. It sits right in front of the ears, and um, it can cause various symptoms from ear clogging, ear pressure, ringing in the ears, tinnitus. It can cause the perception of um, hearing loss. Um, and because, those, because it sits right in front of the ear, some of the nerves and muscles are actually shared with the ear, so it has this intimate relationship um, between uh, the jaw and the ear. And so it's, it's a, an important part of the, of the exam. Um, okay, so I'm gonna turn it over um, to Dr. Calisano, um, and then we'll, um, I'm happy to answer all your questions at the end. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Diana Calisano. I am a clinical audiologist here at Cornell. Um, I'm happy to be here today. So I'm going to talk to you about hearing loss and tinnitus and expand upon some of the points that Dr. Levenger um, had just made. And again, we'll be taking questions at the end. So. Um, I cannot move on without thanking my colleague, Dr. Sapna Mehta, who uh, helped in creating this presentation, but unfortunately she could not be here today, so thank you to Dr. Mehta. So taking a step back, we talked a lot about different types of hearing loss already, tinnitus, um, just in general, what can cause hearing loss, but if we take a step back to determining what sound is, sound by definition is a propagation or a disturbance of molecules through the air. Um, and our ears perceive sound, all different types of sound, loud sounds, soft sounds, average sounds, as well as a variety of frequencies. So sound propagates into the ear. Ah, I have a laser pointer. Sound propagates into the ear. Our ear collects sound through the outer ear, which is the most visible part of the ear, or the pinna. The molecules transfer down the ear canal, where they then hit the eardrum, or what's called the tympanic membrane. From there, the vibrations become mechanical energy, and the vibrations rattle the three bones in the middle ear, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. From there, those vibrations push on the oval window and sound gets sent into the cochlea, which is this snail-like structure here. This is the hearing organ. This is basically where all of the magic happens. This is where sound gets transferred from mechanical energy into electrical impulses. The sound gets sent up to the brain and your brain makes sense of the sound. So all of this is happening uh, very quick. As you're listening to me right now, you're hearing my voice your ears are perceiving all different types of frequencies, your brain is making sense of the words that I'm saying all very rapidly. Um, so, so the human ear is a very, very delicate structure and the true size of this structure right here is about the size of a pea. It's very, very tiny. And housed within this structure are thousands and thousands of hair cells. Those are the sensory cells, a little bit different than hair on your head, um, but they are sensory cells. And those are the cells that we need to hear. So um, as Dr. Levenger had mentioned, 
whether it's as a result of the aging process, noise exposure, genetics, ototoxic medication, those hair cells can become dysfunctional over the lifetime. Unfortunately, uh, as humans, we cannot regrow those hair cells. Um, there's a, a myriad of liter um, excuse me, research ongoing, been ongoing for many, many years, decades even, um, trying to regrow those hair cells. And we have not yet been able to do that or translate that research into humans. Um, just as a fun fact, a lot of this research is ongoing in bird auditory systems because bird auditory systems are most similar to ours in terms of structure, um, as well as in terms of how we can encode and perceive sound. So if you've ever seen a dancing parrot, the reason why they can bop their head to the music is because their auditory system can actually uh, perceive the beat of the music, so that's why. Okay, so as I said before, the ear is capable of representing or perceiving loud, um, average, or soft sounds, as well as different frequencies. So the human ear can perceive um, from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And just to give you a point of reference, um, bats can hear up to about 70,000 hertz, which is why they use echolocation. Dogs can hear up to about 40 or 50,000 hertz. So if you've ever um, seen a dog whistle or, or used one or you've uh, heard about that, the reason why dogs can perceive those higher pitch sounds is because they can hear much, their frequency range is much broader than ours. Um, but as I said, the, the cochlea is able to break down all of these frequencies and, you know, speech is a complex sound. Complex sound is a sound that's made up of many frequencies. And so our ears are able to perceive speech and again make use of that sound, which is what we need to communicate. Um, in addition, the ears play off of one another and the brain compares input from both ears in order to localize sound. So being able to tell where sound is coming from. The siren is coming from over this way. Your friend is calling your name from over that way. Um, the ears rely on equal input and th the brain perceives that difference in input to determine where the sound is. And as I said before, after the sound, you know, we, we hear with our ears, but we listen with our brain. Right? So if we didn't have a brain, we wouldn't be hearing anything. Um, so after the sound is collected by the ear, those neural impulses which are sent to the brain is where, this, the, in the auditory cortex, where the information is perceived and used for speech and language and communication. So about 5.3% of the world population have hearing loss. It's, um, fairly large number. Um, in the U.S., one out of every eight people above the 12 years of age have hearing loss in both ears. Um, one out of every five have a unilateral hearing loss or hearing loss in one ear. And about 8.5% of adults between 55 to 64 have hearing loss which impacts them. So hearing loss is invisible, but it can be quite impactful um, for many reasons, both socially and emotionally. We touched on the different types of hearing losses before, but I'd like to go over them again. Sensory neural hearing loss refers to hearing loss that occurs in the sensory part, so in the cochlea, or at the level of the auditory nerve. I'm actually going to use this slide here. I think it will, it will be easier. So sensory neural hearing loss occurs as a result of damage to the cochlea or at the auditory nerve. Conductive hearing loss occurs as a result of some malfunction in the outer ear or the middle ear. And a mixed hearing loss occurs as a result of damage in both compartments. So it could be, you know, middle, it's generally middle ear dysfunction um, associated with sensory neural or inner ear dysfunction. That's a mixed hearing loss when you have both. Um, this tube right here is the, the eustachian tube. If you've ever been on an airplane and on the descent, you know, you're told that you should swallow or yawn or chew gum. Uh, that's because this little tube helps to pop open and equalize air pressure between the atmosphere and your ears, and it brings in fresh air to the middle ear space. 
Um, so, you know, oftentimes, just as a result of the aging process, the damage occurs in the inner ear. One of the most crucial tools that we use as audiologists and one of, this is basically your hearing test. So we, we take, at the evaluation, we are testing your hearing, looking for your thresholds across the frequency range and using this audiogram as a tool to guide us in recommendations. Um, so this is basically a snapshot of your picture, uh, excuse me, of, of your, a picture of your hearing test or a snapshot of your hearing on the day that you come to see us. And just to orient you to this graph here, up top here is pitch. So all the way to the left is your lower pitches or your bass tones. To the right, you have your higher pitch tones or your treble. And on the side here is volume. So very, very soft sounds are at the top and very loud sounds are at the bottom. Now, you'll see some pictures here on the audiogram and as well as letters of our language. So the pictures, the location of the picture is the pitch that it is typically produced at or the frequency it's produced at as well as the volume that it's produced at. So for example, a piano is approximately 80 decibels and the fundamental frequency is about 1,000 hertz. If you look at the speech sounds, so you have your S, your S, your K, your uh, um, F, S, T, H sounds. Again, the location of the letter on the audiogram is the frequency that it's produced at as well as the volume. And why this is important is because as we document your hearing, we can start to look at your thresholds, which I'll go over this in just a minute. We look at your thresholds and we compare it to the different letters of our language and we can determine which sounds you are missing, which translate into some of the communication difficulties you may be having. These circles or the, the red symbols here represent hearing in the right ear and the X's represent hearing in the left ear. So for this individual, they have um, normal hearing in the low pitches and the hearing loss as a, um, as a function of frequency or as the frequency gets higher, the hearing starts to deteriorate. So their hearing is worse in the higher pitches of sounds as it is in the lower pitches, much better in the lows. Why this is important is because if this person, let's say this person does not have hearing aids, um, this person likely is missing all of these sounds up here. And the crucial thing that you have to remember is the consonant sounds of speech, which fall in the mid to higher frequency range, deliver the clarity of speech. So oftentimes with this type of hearing loss, our patients will tell us, I hear people, I know that they're saying something to me, but I cannot understand what they're saying. Um, you know, TV, you're turning up the TV because you're trying to understand, you're, you're looking to gain clarity of speech, not necessarily volume. Um, on this type of hearing loss, you would expect that that would be the case because the vowel sounds carry the power behind speech. The sound ah uh, is much more powerful than so essentially, your ears are picking up on those vowel sounds. You hear it, but you're not able to distinguish the words. This is just a representation of a flatter hearing loss. So this individual would have difficulty hearing all of these sounds um, if the hearing loss is not um, aided. And so again, we use this as a tool to guide us. Now what's very important about the audiogram is usually the numbers tell us one story and the patient tells us another. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is a guide and that's really all it is. What's more important to us is functionality and what our patients are telling us so we can use your feedback and use your description of your, your listening needs and your listening lifestyle to gain a complete picture um, as to the struggles that you may or may not be having. So what happens with hearing loss? What does it mean um, for communication? What does it mean just in terms of detecting sounds? When, you're, when you experience a hearing loss, you may start to notice that softer sounds become less audible. Um, you may have more difficulty hearing people if they're talking, uh, if they're whispering to you or talking to you from another room. Uh, sound 
can't travel around walls that easily, but we all have habits of talking to our loved ones from three rooms away. So, um, you know, these, these are some situations that may be problematic for normal hearing, but typically, you know, uh, they can be signs of hearing loss. Difficulty hearing and noise. If you walk into a restaurant, um, albeit all the restaurants in New York are noisy these days, so even people with normal hearing have difficulty. But these are some signs. Um, you may be asking people to repeat themselves more often than not. Uh, you may be asking for repetition or rephrasing. Um, you might find yourself doing a lot of nodding, um, but not really hearing what that person is saying. Um, it can affect your ability to interact with people. It can affect your ability to, you know, or it may prevent somebody from wanting to engage in more challenging listening situations because it's more difficult. Um, it may prevent you from wanting to go to that lecture because uh, it might not be as easy to hear. So these are some signs. Um, again, also turning up the TV is a big sign that we um, that we can that we hear from our patients. I'm turning up the volume or I'm having difficulty on the telephone. I can tell you that oftentimes it is the loved ones around the person with hearing loss that often detect the issues first. Um, because hearing loss, for the most part, not always, but hearing loss is generally gradual. And because it is gradual, we are humans, we are very smart, and we learn really great compensatory techniques. So you are all probably lip reading right now, even though you were never trained to lip read, but that's a visual cue that we all use to hear. I, we always hear with our ears, but we hear with our eyes too. That's somebody that probably, some, nobody ever told you, but mm -hmm. that's, that's important. Um, visual cues are very important. So, so anyway, these are some signs that may suggest you or someone around you is struggling to hear. If you are concerned, fear not. Uh, we are here on the fifth floor. Um, but even if you choose not to come here, um, you know, always consult with an ENT and an audiologist. As Dr. Levenger mentioned before, you will have a full medical workup. And in conjunction with that appointment, you will see um, an audiologist and you will have a hearing test and, you know, the results will be available to you immediately. So you'll be able to know if there's a hearing loss and if so, recommendations will be made based on the findings. Um, there are different types of hearing loss, however. So ultimately, you know, going back to the ear, nose and throat doctor, um, you will be able to determine if there are any medical interventions to help um, improve the hearing, and if not, you know, what other audiologic techniques can be used. You know, once you've identified there's a hearing loss, or even if you have not been to an audiologist yet, communication strategies are huge, and they really help to supplement um, hearings. We'll talk, hearing, we'll talk a little bit about hearing aids um, and realistic expectations, but the truth is, is that audiology was not founded as a profession um, on hearing aids. And so audiology stemmed as a profession back in the 1940s, um, um, a lot of soldiers were returning home with noise-induced hearing loss. So audiology is a profession founded on counseling and oral rehabilitation. Um, hearing aids are great, they do a lot, but they're not everything. So communication strategies are huge. And there are also other assistive listening technologies that are not necessarily, they don't come in the form of hearing aids, but other technologies that can be used to help you to hear. Hearing aids, as I said, are fantastic. Um, they do a lot. They help to make sounds more audible for you so that you are not straining or um, you know, trying as hard to hear. They're giving you more, a crisper sound quality. And the idea behind hearing aids is it's not designed to sound like a microphone per se. Um, it is, again, designed to make sounds more accessible to you so that the ease of communication comes more readily. Hearing aids are not perfect. One of the challenges that we run into 
um, that we try to that we, that we try to um, avoid is setting up unrealistic expectations. Um, I can tell you that the success of hearing aids is dependent on a lot of factors, but the first factor being motivation to wear them. We see a lot of patients coming in the clinic whose spouses or family members have asked them to be there that day, but they have not necessarily wanted to come themselves. So motivation to wear hearing aids plays a huge role in how successful um, you, you may be with your hearing aids. Um, in addition to that, just realistic expectations. They are great, but they do not do everything. Um, there will still be certain situations that are problematic because of the, the acoustics uh, where you are. They take time to get adjusted to. Um, they're unlike glasses in the sense that within a few hours or a few days, your eyes adjust. Uh, hearing aids are a digital product, so we are fine-tuning the hearing aids specific to your hearing loss, but at the end of the day, it is so, a, still a digital processing of sound, so it takes some time to get used to the sound quality. Um, but patients typically acclimate in a few weeks or so. New York State law states that there are 45 days, 45 calendar days, to try the hearing aids. So that's um, you know non-negotiable. You have at least 45 days um, from the day that you walk out with hearing aids, and that's really your time to test drive them. Because uh, truth be told, if you come to the clinic and we're talking to you in a quiet office you're gonna tell me that you hear fine and that you don't need hearing aids because it's quiet. So ultimately, you have to be able to test them in your regular listening environments to see if they're working for you. And in addition to that, um, you still may need other support. We do have a speech pathologist on staff who works um, specifically with hearing impaired patients, uh, and she does oral rehabilitation training. We have other support services um, as well. So you can really tackle your hearing loss and manage your hearing loss from many different facets. The hearing aid, so the basics of the hearing aid um, in terms of mechanics, they consist of one microphone, one amplifier, and a receiver, which is the speaker, and that's the part that outputs the sound. Uh, there is, as I said before, a digital processor, which in the case of hearing aids, makes soft sounds audible, Average sounds average and loud sounds comfortable. Uh, one of the questions that we get often is, well, is my hearing aid going to amplify the siren? The siren's already loud. I'm sure you don't need to hear it any louder than it already is. Um, so the, the hearing aid has a way of compressing the sound so that if it is a loud sound, it will, not, it will detect that it's a loud sound and not over amplify that for you. Um, but on the contrary, making soft sounds audible to you is very important. So if somebody's talking from a distance, or if somebody in your you know, immediate circle tends to speak at a softer volume, uh, making those sounds more accessible to you is the goal. This is something that is very important. Um, hearing aids do not fully eliminate background noise. Background noise is something that is ongoing, whether you have normal hearing, hearing loss, wearing hearing aids. I hear background noise right now, I hear the ventilation system. Um, so, so there's really no way to fully eliminate them because they are sounds. There are ways to make it so that those softer sounds are not as perceptible. Um, but the whole idea with hearing aids is that they give you a, a very full-bodied sound and give you access to all of the sounds in the environment um, that somebody you know, would be able to hear. There are different styles that are available. So styles that go completely in the ear here, or styles that go behind the ear. And really the, the difference between the styles or the difference in recommendation boils down to the type and the degree of your hearing loss. Um, what's also really important is your residual hearing. And in some cases, the residual hearing is unfortunately not great. And at that point, um, at that juncture, we would have to make an assessment um, as to whether or not hearing aids are an appropriate option for you. But again, so they come behind the ear where there's a, a small piece that sits behind the ear, a thin wire that runs down the side of the head, and a small dome that goes in the ear 
or the entire ear canal is placed, or excuse me, the entire hearing aid is placed into the ear canal. And you'll, if I could call your attention to the side over here, in the ear, in the canal, completely in the canal, an invisible canal it is basically the most visible custom product or in the ear hearing aid to the most discreet. So this is the largest, this is the smallest. For people who have, um, let's just say, normal hearing on one side or better hearing on one side and no usable hearing on the other side, whether it's a profound hearing loss or the residual hearing is quite poor, we may recommend something called the cross or the bicross, which is um, a transmitter that sits, both of them look like hearing aids, so they look like, they can look like this or this. Uh, the transmitter sits on the poor ear, uh, so for all intensive purposes, my left ear is a profound hearing loss, my right ear is normal. So the transmitter sits on my left ear and transmits sound over to my better hearing right ear. This is great because it gives you better access to sounds that are happening on the left side. So if you're sitting at a dinner table, you know, now you have access to the person that's speaking to your left rather than having to turn and talk to them. Um, it doesn't improve localization totally because again, we rely on equal input from both ears to, to localize effectively. And then for people who um, may not qualify for these types of hearing aids because of the degree and, and type of hearing loss, we might recommend an implantable hearing aid or implantable devices, which we'll get to. Cochlear implants are a, a type of implantable device that are recommended for people who have a very profound degree of hearing loss or a very um, precipitously sloping hearing loss so that their hearing is you know, normal in the very low pitches and then slopes off pretty sharply to a, a profound, severe or profound hearing loss. Um, and the idea behind this or the way that this works is it actually is there is an internal component that is implanted into the cochlea and the part of that internal component bypasses the part of the ear, the inner ear that's not working and stimulates the auditory nerve directly. There is also a piece um, after the surgery, this is a surgery, um, after this surgery occurs and the patient has healed, there is an external processor that is used to communicate to the internal component via radiomagnetic waves. So this piece can be removed at the end of the day. The patient still has the implantable piece inside, um, but when they take this device off, they do not have any hearing. So this is more of an um, electronic, uh, electric way of hearing. So in addition to hearing aids, cochlear implants, um, there are assistive technologies that are available to hearing impaired patients um, or users of hearing aids. Um, so you, there are options like FM systems, remote microphones, looping systems. If you've ever been, I had a, a conversation with a patient today who's going to the Metropolitan Opera and they provide, as they do in most theaters, uh, headphones. So that's an assistive listening device which streams the sound from the stage or from the actor or actress's mouth directly into your ears. Um, there's captioning, you have communication access, real-time translation, uh, wired or wireless <coughs> headsets which we talked about, and then you have your audio streaming device for the TV, which are your TV ears. So there are other options, other devices that are available to you if you're not um, quite at the point where you need or want hearing aids. Um, in addition to that, uh, Dr. Levenger had mentioned some of these devices earlier. There are options for um, amplified or visual tactile alerting devices. So this is very important because hearing loss does speak to safety. If you're not able to hear your fire alarm, you need to find a way to do that. Uh, that's very important. Uh, so it can be in the form of flashing lights. There are some fire alarms that um, provide a, a vibration. So you stick it under your mattress and if in the event it ever needed to wake you, it could. Um, Amplified telephones are great, as well as caption call telephones. Um, this is a type of device that requires Wi-Fi or requires an internet connection, but it's 
has a visual display so that the person that you're on the phone with, their conversation is being uh, translated into writings and you can see it right there as you're on the phone with them. So it helps you to reinforce what you're hearing by visually reading what they're saying. And um, you can stream your phone calls now to hearing aids. Hearing aids are smart now. They're, they're all Bluetooth compatible, most of them. So there are options for streaming cell phone calls or music, podcasts, directly into your hearing aids, which basically serves as uh, wireless earbuds. Communication requires two people, it's two-way street. So um, as somebody who might be struggling to hear, you can be assertive in asking the people that you're speaking with to either speak up, speak slower. We're New Yorkers, so everybody seems to speak very quickly. Um, you know, be communicating in good lighting. That's very important because as I said before, visual cues are key and you have to be able to see the speaker's face, read their lips, look at their body, you know, their facial expressions. These are all really important. Um, as well as reducing background noise. If you are having a conversation with a loved one but the TV is on, make sure that you walk over and turn the TV off or put it on mute. Turn the faucet off. Uh, walk into the room to make sure that you're, you know, you're talking to the person in the same room rather than from a distance. Okay, that we covered. Okay, so let's talk about tinnitus. Um, tinnitus is defined as the perception of sound in the absence of external sound. So it is a subjective sound originating from damage to the ears. As Dr. Levenger mentioned, it's just a symptom of hearing loss, um, but it can be perceived quite loud. So in some people, it can occur spontaneously, um, whereas in others, it can extend for a period of time. And chronic tinnitus occurs more frequently, lasts longer, um, and it can definitely be disturbing to the person who is hearing it. So there are about 50 million Americans walking around with perceptible tinnitus, uh, meaning that they can perceive it. Uh, only about 20% of that population reports um, tinnitus disturbance. So there is a, a certain subset of the population that is actually disturbed to the point where you know, it, it interferes with social um, abilities, concentration, ability to work, so on and so forth. So again, 30 to 50 million Americans walking around with tinnitus. It is more prevalent for adults between ages 65 to 85 years, but tin children can be impacted as well. Um, this is important for us as we, you know, as a child, it may not be easy to verbalize that, and it also may be their baseline. They may not know anything different, so we do ask about that. Um, and one out of 200 adults report tinnitus as a debilitating problem. There are many causes of tinnitus, some which are medically treatable, some are not. Dr. Levenger did cover this earlier. Um, hearing loss being the main, the main culprit, uh, as well as some ear-related diseases, noise exposure, head injuries, cardiovascular disease, TMJ, um, and certain medications which can contribute to the onset or exacerbation of tinnitus. If you are experiencing tinnitus, um, it is always important to come to an ENT or to an audiologist uh, so that you can have a medical workup to determine if there's um, any medical reason causing the tinnitus and if there's any medical intervention that may uh, be applied um, to alleviate or, or help the hearing loss, which secondary to the tinnitus um, can help. Um, in the event that there is no medical um, you know, intervention, you know, one of the things that we hear from our patients often is that, you know, there's no cure for tinnitus, and which I agree with, um, but they're also feeling a little bit hopeless about what can be done. So from an audiologic perspective, there is a lot that can be done. Um, I'm gonna skip this for just a minute. We here at Cornell are skilled in tinnitus retraining therapy, um, working with hearing aids, so there are hearing aids that are combination devices. They help your hearing loss and your tinnitus within the same device. And they can, just by using a hearing aid alone, you may be hearing more externally, which may help to reduce the awareness of the tinnitus. The goal of any one of these therapies is never to fully alleviate the tinnitus, 
It's more about um, reducing your awareness and changing your reaction so that if you are a patient who is feeling very disturbed by the tinnitus, we can help to kind of peel back those layers and make it more manageable for you on a day-to-day -day basis. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a therapy that is administered by a psychologist, so we do not administer that here. Um, and that's somewhat different in that the psychologist helps the patient to work through some of the negative connotations and the narratives that they have, or behaviors, they've created um, in response to the tinnitus. So helping to kind of reset the mind frame of um, that patient. Just in general though, taking care of yourself, uh, mindfulness, meditation, deep breathing ex exercises, guided imagery, um, any type of relaxation therapy is recommended. Uh, of course, if you're going to consider acupuncture or biofeedback or taking any medications, you should always consult your physician first before moving forward with anything um, as those treatments are considered to be experimental. There's really not a, a lot of literature to support their um, effectiveness one way or the other. And um, one of the things that's very important, which we are all exposed to here in the city, um, noise exposure is huge and it can contribute to hearing loss, which can therefore lead to tinnitus. So if you are going to find yourself going to a very loud performance or you are a musician um, and you're exposing yourself, um, you know, always be cautious about that and you can go and get yourself some more generic earplugs, or if you would like to go one step above that, there are custom earplugs as well. Again, there are many, many tinnitus supplements out on the market today. Um, you know, the unfortunate part about this is that they are not considered food or drugs by the FDA, so they do, are not held to the same rigorous standards as the prescription medication. Um, so there are, there can be um, ingredients in these medications that are actually known to contribute or cause tinnitus rather than help it. So just be very careful and again always consult with your physician if you're considering um, beginning to take any new supplements for tinnitus. So we are just Finished with our lecture, we're gonna open the floor to questions. Um, and Dr. Levenger and I will try to field the questions as best as possible. So um, we'll go from here. Okay, I saw a few hands in the back shoot up quick. So yes, you. Thank you for